Welcome back. You're listening to Get Real with Bob and Stacy. You're joining us for our Leaders and Legends segment. Our guest is Deborah Shames, author of Out Front and co-founder of Eloquy, a presentation and a communication company. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Thank you. So I want to give everybody some background on Deborah. Public speaking is our final frontier. Women have advanced in many arenas, yet we will never achieve our full potential if we avoid public speaking or follow outdated techniques that do not reflect our authentic voice. It's time for women to create our own destinies. Better communication and public speaking gives us the ability to seize every opportunity and aspire to new heights. So whether yes. pitching for new business, delivering a talk at a conference, raising money for our favorite nonprofit, or communicating one-on-one, we can become a powerful force when we learn to speak with authenticity and confidence. Deborah Shames is co-founder of Eloquy. She has trained thousands of executives, celebrities, and professionals at all levels in their career, from just starting out to running their own companies. She delivers practical techniques for how to elevate speaking from mediocre to mastery. In 2016, her book came out called Out Front, How Women Can Become Engaging, Memorable, and Fearless Speakers, it was released by Ben Bella Books, and it's available at many online retailers. So first of all, let's, I know in your book you debunk the myth that if you're not an expert, you don't deserve to speak on a topic. Talk about that for a few minutes. Too many women hold themselves back because they believe if they're not an expert, they don't deserve to speak on a subject. Well, here's the truth. We don't do business with experts. Trying to become an expert puts way too much pressure on us as women. And better to go out and speak as a motivator or a seasoned veteran or a facilitator, something more in sync and in line with who you really are. Give up that need to be an expert. It doesn't serve us. Hmm, I love that. Hmm. And also, what, one of the pieces that I know you talk about in your book is I think a lot of times as not just women, but anybody, we don't want to get out and speak or get in front of a crowd, small or large, because we feel like we have not perfected our speech, etc. And you say that being polished and perfect can actually hurt you. Yes. It, the truth is women and, and many men spend way too much time researching, writing out, memorizing, or reading their content And that's the wrong way to go. You cannot connect and engage with an audience if you're striving for perfection. What you're doing instead is proving how smart you are or proving that you're not going to make a mistake. It's much better to have a conversational tone, work off an outline, make eye contact, and engage an audience. It'll not only save you a lot of prep time, but you'll get higher evaluations, you'll achieve your intention much more readily, and so we all have to give up that need for perfection i love that period do you have any advice for people that do have those critical voices in their heads telling them that they're not good enough and they shouldn't be the one speaking how do we shut that off yeah and it is really about the critical voice stacy Mm -hmm. and it plagues so many people and it's louder than our own uh, our own personality so the way to shut it off first Have a clear intention of what it is you want to achieve every time you get up to speak. That's very different than saying, oh, my gosh, um, I'm going over my content, and what if I forget something, and they really don't want to listen to me? All that little chatter that goes in our head. Have a clear intention. And along that line, right before you speak, don't ever go over your content because you'll go, oh, my God, I just forgot something. What if I forget something when I'm in front of a room? And then realize that the audience of one or a hundred is not judging you harshly. They want you to be good. They want to take away something of value, and that's your job. And then if you still have anxiety, a couple of things you can do. Make sure that you prep in the sense of if you've got a PowerPoint, check out that you have the batteries and it works with their system. If you're speaking somewhere unfamiliar to you, go out and check out the space ahead of time. Surprises causes more anxiety than anything else. And then, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, take on a role. So you're not sending Stacy out to speak. You're sending out the motivator, the seasoned veteran, the visionary, the facilitator. All those techniques 
will reduce anxiety and make you more effective. Hmm. What I will say about speaking in my own career, one of the things that I've been lucky about is that as a business owner, my company has grown from over the last 10 years from say 10 real estate agents to 400 real estate agents. So having getting to speak in front of people, I had to start with a small group and then I worked my way up over time. But what I'll say is I am that person that has like crazy voices in my head. And, (laughs) and the bad thing about that is then I make these PowerPoints that are like 400 pages Uh, with written stuff because I'm, I don't want to forget something. I've gotten much better over time perfecting my PowerPoints and taking away all the bullet points because people don't want to read my stuff. But yes, as a new speaker, like that's what ends up happening is you're so afraid that you're going to forget something that you stick everything into a PowerPoint and nobody wants to see bullet lists or even words on a PowerPoint. Like, do you have any advice for how long a PowerPoint should be? What should be on it? Yes. Yes. First of all, the reason I wrote out front is because women more than men, capable, talented, articulate women hold themselves back, and make sure that they put everything on their PowerPoint so they don't make a mistake or leave anything out. Mm -hmm. Well, the emphasis is on the wrong place. It's in your head. It's improving yourself. Let's put that aside as 1950s philosophy and get out there and speak typically and most times without a PowerPoint at all because audiences hate them, Mm -hmm. and we don't like them either. But if you have to use one, have a presenter deck and a leave behind deck because mm. the worst thing you can do with PowerPoint is make it your script up on the screen. Yes. It is not your crutch. It is not your queuing device. PowerPoint was meant to be a visual medium. And then your job when you present with PowerPoint, because we've trained teams all over the country, Mattel, TD Ameritrade, law firms, accounting firms, is use it as a visual medium. Put up pictures, graphs, charts, and then (laughs) always remember the B button. It's on your keyboard, and it's on most remotes. The B button or a little black box will make the screen go black. You haven't lost your slides, Mm -hmm. but it allows you to step out in front of the device, in front of PowerPoint, tell a story, engage your audience, and then when you hit it again, the slide is still there. But mainly, Stacy, know that you're you're the main act. PowerPoint is just your support. Mm -hmm. And the more you take chances, the more that you get out there, not only will you feel better about yourself, Mm -hmm. but the audience will love you for it. Yes. And when you have young daughters, nieces, even younger associates in your life, start them out in low ante environments, just what you said. Mm -hmm. Have them give a toast or introduce Mm -hmm. a colleague or someplace where the anxiety and stress is not so great. And the other way is to put them into acting for the young folks, the the teenagers, even even kids under 12. Put them in an acting, an improv, or a debate class where they're forced to think on their feet. Start them young, and it will be much easier when they get to our level of being professionals. Hmm. I love all of this. Um... Excellent advice. Just as in my own life as a business owner and speaker, I've definitely cut down. My PowerPoints are no longer 150 (laughs) slides, but there's still 20 or 25 slides. And I would love to eventually get to a point where I just have the confidence to get in front of a group. So when you're coaching somebody and they want to get away from a PowerPoint, And let's just say they have to go out and do a one-hour talk to Uh their group of people. Like, first of all, how do you help them? Or How should they organize it? How much of it should be stories? How much should they rehearse it in advance in order to to deliver? Okay, let me take one at a time. Yes. First of all, don't start with the PowerPoint following the wizard and constructing your slides. It's Mm -hmm. a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Second, Always start with what your intention is. What do you want to achieve? Is it to prove that your services are critical to their success? Mm -hmm. Is it so that they see you as a partner? Determine your intention first before you do anything. Mm -hmm. Then Then decide what role to take on. So when you have intention and role 
and it's always based on the audience, meaning it changes whenever you speak, Mm -hmm. then you can start thinking about the rest of the presentation. Next is your open. How do you grab their attention right away? How do you set the tone in the stage for everything that comes next? And then divide your content into no more than three buckets, three talking points. It's all that a human being can absorb, and we're not proving how smart we are or how much we can throw the kitchen sink at them. We're achieving our objective with three talking points. Mm -hmm. It's there that you decide to include PowerPoint, which will allow those 150 slides Mm -hmm. not just down to 25, but maybe down to eight slides. Mm -hmm. And then the close is what they'll remember most. So you've got to put your attention on the close. Hmm. And when I coach individuals, when I go into work with teams, we always put the PowerPoint module last because we've created great speakers and they're so, they're authentic and they're engaging with an audience. And then they add PowerPoint and everything changes. It's as if aliens have inhabited their body. Right. So... That's why we include it last, and so many companies, from Steve Jobs at Apple when he was alive to GM, they don't even allow vendors to use PowerPoint. Hmm. And we teach pitch skills because if you want to land more clients, if you want to be seen as a thought leader in your industry, the idea is it's you that they're connecting and buying from. Hmm. So I could talk a lot more. Stories are great. How many? I can't tell you. But I will tell you that stories are the silver bullet, and you can put them in the beginning, middle, or end of your presentation. You can use it as a way to introduce yourself at a networking meeting. Stories are just the best. They have to be structured, and we have a a template for that too. But when you tell stories, people don't argue with you, and they're persuaded by you. They're your experience. And, And one last thing. We make decisions with our right brain first, shared emotions, value system, whole idea, synthesis. Then, as humans, we back it up with left brain, statistical analysis. Most people, when they come to see us, are relying way too heavily on their left brain. It's why they want to get everything right. It's why they want to parse out the numbers and give us facts and figures. Reverse it. Start with the whole idea, your right brain, then back it up with evidence. You're well on your way. Hmm. I love this only because I know I, I speak a lot for my own company and I go to a lot of events and I watch speakers and I'll say for me, my favorite speakers always have no power story. Yeah. They're just, they just get out there and they start talking. They have relevant content where they tie stories to whatever their try whatever their pitches and it's always engaging. Like you're not right. And it's memorable. Yeah, right. absolutely. So as far as your business goes, um, first of all, for anybody just tuning in, we have Deborah Shame. She wrote the book Out Front, How Women Beca- Can Become Engaging, Memorable, and Fearless Speakers. Um, but you also have a business for coaching people to become better speakers. So can you do that? Um, across the country, across the world, how do you how do you help people remotely? Yes, and we do have we have six other trainers, okay. and Luke, we does, mm-hmm. and we travel to our clients' locations all over the country: Realogy, okay. One America, mm-hmm. Mattel, TD Ameritrade, law firms, accounting firms, and we never work with more than ten people in a group, and we always send out two trainers, male and female, because the idea is. You can't follow a template or a script to become a great speaker. It has to be tailored to you. So we cover all the elements I talked about, intention and role and storytelling and engagement techniques and how to rehearse, which you always need to do, by the way. Mm -hmm. Never wing it. And we do these in a couple different ways. We have corporate trainings, a three-part training called Own the Room, Mm -hmm. and it's always tailored to the company. We also give two-day immersion workshops in Santa Fe, where we bring together a diverse group of executives from all over the country. I love these workshops. It's in the finest hotel. We feed you. We bring together a local chef. Mm -hmm. We bring in speakers. So we also have those immersion workshops. And then 
we have 25 people right now, individuals like you, executives, who want us to coach them and train them for their particular outcomes. Right. Um, now, if you were in L.A. or Orange County, we also give public workshops. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you've spent years becoming really good at what you do in business. Why do you think overnight you can become a great speaker? Right. It takes tools and skills, and it doesn't take as long as it took you to become good at what you do, but you have to put your attention on it. And at eloquy.biz, that website, at outfront.biz, we list our calendar, our events. But know that anybody can pick up the phone and call me, and I'll work through it with them, and I'll tell them what their options are. Hmm. It's Excellent. awesome stuff because even though it's public speaking, I feel like every salesperson in every industry, I mean, we're in the job of public speaking. It's just you might yeah. only be speaking to one person or a room of 5,000 people, but we're all in the business of public speaking. So this is awesome stuff. If you could repeat again uh, where people can find more about you and your company. Yes. And by the way, if you head up a nonprofit, if you want to be seen as a thought leader or a TED speaker, mm -hmm. these are all, you're right, it's not just business folks or sales teams that need to speak. So you can go to our website, Eloquy, E-L-O-Q-U-I dot biz, B-I-Z. You can go to the website for Outfront, which, by the way, was just released in January of this year. Mm -hmm. That's Outfront, one word, dot biz, B-I-Z. And that will give you a schedule of events. It will give you our blog. You can sign up for the Eloquy Tip of the Week, which has been coming out every Sunday morning for 13 years. My partner, David, and I write a speaker tip, quote, and word, and we have over 4,000 followers on it. Wow. Those are the different ways to reach us. Thank you Excellent. so much. That is Deborah Shames, author of Outfront, How Women Can Become Engaging, Memorable, and Fearless Speakers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. That's all for this edition of Get Real. Tune in again next weekend for more.